An interesting thing about armies and militaries are the doctrines. These are like rule books and the general method that a country uses to wage war. Whether it be fast-paced pressure and be vegan's creed, or quote-unquote war of movement, which eventually developed into the Blitzkrieg of World War II, or an American use of firepower and combined arms, which devastates anyone foolish enough to go against them. But today I'm going to talk about the Soviet way to wage warfare. This will be a general overview and will try to give you a good idea on how the Soviets like to fight their wars, from about the 1930s to the 1990s, with most of it developing in World War II. There will obviously be exceptions, but this is generally how it was done. Also, I take most of this from Armies of Sand by Kenneth M. Polak. This book mostly deals with Middle Eastern armies, but it covers the Soviet doctrine very well, and using experts on Soviet warfare such as John Erickson or Christopher Donnelly. So let's get right into it. So when talking about the Soviet way of war, we need to look at the operational level. This is the campaign, or an operation itself in a way. It's higher up than tactics, but lower than strategic. Where tactics is winning a battle, strategic is winning a war, operational focuses on winning a campaign in a particular set of battles. A way to think about it is in D-Day, for example. Operation Overlord is the operational level, while the specific beaches are on the tactical level, and the general plan to break into Europe is on the strategic level. The Soviets concluded that the best way to win wars would be at the operational level, and to put their focus here. You can win or lose battles, and still win and lose the war, but if you win the campaigns time and time again, then victory is assured. This went the other way, though, too, in the Soviet mind. If they're winning battles after battle, yet losing campaigns, it really doesn't matter how many engagements you win, you're still going to lose the war. Thus, the Soviets focused on the operational. To win this, they were to make sure that operational level commanders were very skilled and had all the assets they needed to secure victory. Operational commanders were also allowed a great deal of freedom in planning. Their goal was not to win one battle, but to win the campaign. The Soviets also wanted operational officers to be skilled, innovative, aggressive, and just basically able to win the campaign. This means that junior officers, or officers with the rank such as lieutenant, captain, and field officers leading company, battalion, regiments, and even divisions were not expected to be as aggressive or innovative as their higher-ups. In the Soviet mind, if the lower-level commanders were able to follow their orders down to the letter, then it'd be easier for the commanders at the top. That being said, Soviet junior officers were not mindless. They had quote-unquote battle drills for given situations. These were ways to deal with a problem at hand. Think of it like an American football game. You're not going to use the same play in first and ten that you would on third and second. So Soviet junior officers had methods in place to deal with given situations. These situations were to be rehearsed and known as to make it easier on the higher level commanders. One of the most important parts of the Soviet doctrine was to attack. They stress offensive time and time again. Although this idea came around before World War II, the Soviets saw firsthand what would happen if they allowed the enemy to attack them, such as the Germans. The enemy must not be allowed to attack. Attacking does a couple of things. First off, attacking makes your enemy have to respond. They have to transfer troops around to meet it. Attacking also makes it so the attacker knows what terrain they're fighting on. An attacker with good intelligence can also make it so that they outnumber their opponent. Most offensives that had the defender outnumbering the attacker usually end in failure. The Soviets saw defense being a good option when there wasn't enough resources to attack, whether it be tanks, troops, or planes. Attacking was so important to the Soviets that they were taught to go on an offensive immediately after the enemy had launched one of their own. The Soviets needed a couple of things for these offenses to work. They found that surprise was a major key. In Operation Bagration, or however you pronounce it, the Soviets didn't use any artillery in the initial operation, attacked in rain, and the Germans never even had an idea an offensive on that scale was going to take place. This would be somewhat replicated in the West in the Battle of the Bulge. Also, the Soviets stressed attacking on the wings of the opposition, as this would lead to their collapse. This can be seen in multiple battles in World War II, such as Stalingrad. The Soviets were also very exceptional at camouflaging things like artillery and using deception. Fake attacks were an important part in the Soviet strategy, throwing the enemy off guard. Intelligence gathering was also stressed. The Soviets wanted to know what was in front of them at all times. In World War II, 25-30% to 30 of all Soviet air sorties were just for intelligence gathering purposes alone, a massive amount considering the scale of the Eastern Front and the length of the war. Another aspect of Soviet offenses was advancing as far as you could. These thrusts were devastating to the enemy, and in World War II in years 1944 and 45, 
Some Soviet units made it as far as 200 kilometers into German lines. The Soviets also liked to do encirclements, or at least try to go for them, the most famous being at Stalingrad. Another thing the Soviets stressed was combined arms. This is when you try to use tanks, infantry, armor, and other parts of the military in conjunction with one another. The Soviet commanders saw how effective it was when the Germans did it in the beginning of the war, and how ineffective it was when the Soviets tried to in the beginning of the war but failed. The Soviets tried to put combined arms into their doctrine, and they became very good at it, using all their resources together such as planes, tanks, and infantry. One example of combined arms I'd like to point out was actually in Afghanistan. A Soviet attack on the Mujahideen would have helicopter troops encircle the Mujahideen in a valley, trapping them, as Soviet armor and infantry would move into the valley and clear out slowly. Some Mujahideen said this is the most effective Soviet tactic in the war, and it was so effective that the United States and Great Britain had to give Stingray and blowpipe weapons to the Mujahideen to counter it. Using helicopters, armor, and infantry, and even special forces all in unison was very effective. The Soviets also made very good use of their numbers. While maybe not in 1941 and 1942 per se, in the rest of the war the Soviets would outnumber the Axis in most battles. It's a myth that the Soviets just won because of their greater numbers, but they definitely made use of them. This can be seen in attacking. The Soviets, because they were attacking repeatedly, could choose a sector where they would outnumber the Germans, 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 in tanks, troops, and aircraft, and then decimate the opposition. But the Soviets could afford losses in most battles. And in most battles in World War II, they would lose more men than the Germans. The Soviets were able to take losses all while winning on the operational level and getting closer and closer to Germany. Another thing the Soviets did was how they put troops into action. A Soviet unit, like a division for example, would be in combat for about a week and then be taken out to get replacements. And a new division, a rested one, would be put in. This does a couple of things. First off, it allows the Soviets to replace losses easier as units are cycling back and getting much needed rest, but it also allows the Soviets to continue the attack with fresh troops. All armies try to do this in some way, shape, or form, but the Soviets were very good at it, and this allowed some breakthroughs and massive advances in World War II. This goes into gear too. Soviet gear was to be repaired, but if it couldn't, it wasn't that big of a deal, as they could just get another tank, rifle, or plane. Air power for the Soviets was also focused on combined arms. The Soviets never really liked or got on board with the Western Strategic Destruction Doctrine, so they just sort of went with supporting troops on the ground and controlling the skies. This included air support, intelligence gathering, and Battlefield Air Interaction, or BAI. The Soviets too learned the importance of controlling the skies in World War II, and they couldn't let the opposition do so. NATO and the West had something on the Soviets. NATO was going to jam the GCI feed during a war, which is the Ground Controlled Intercept which is people on the ground directing the pilots. So Soviet pilots were taught to work around the GCI feed and not use it for everything. GCI feed can't help you out in a dogfight anyway where split second decisions can determine failure or success. So the Soviet air doctrine was kind of opposite of the ground doctrine. They stressed individual importance so that pilots would perform well in dogfights and fight isolated. They were also expected to be imaginative, aggressive, and innovative in aerial combat and to work without the GCI feed. So now I'm going to give you a couple of pros and cons of having a doctrine like this. Also, I'm giving you some real world examples of it being used. First off, we're going to start off with the pros and cons. It's really important that the Soviets understand that they can lose battles in some spots. Not every engagement with the Germans, Mujahideen, Americans, French, and British need to be victories. But a series of battles won will lead to victory. And the Soviets know this, and that will eventually win the war. Another advantage is the doctrine of attack. The Soviets were very good at it and had all the benefits of an attack I mentioned previously. And if a hypothetical World War III started in Germany, I think NATO forces would have been kicked around for a while, for at least the first couple weeks. Attacking allows the Soviets to control where the battle is going, as well as controlling what units they can put into it. Attacking is also great for morale, and the way the Soviets cycled units out, it would lead to better unit cohesion and morale, which would lead to more victories for the Soviets. The Soviet way of surprise is also very interesting to look at. It's not easy to surprise an entire German army. They were also very good at deception and intelligence gathering. The Americans constantly had problems with the terrain that they were attacking in. Most famously, the Hurricane Forest in Okinawa, where if more intelligence was gathered, then some mistakes wouldn't have been made. The Soviet Air Doctrine also had tons of benefits. Focusing on individual pilot skill will lead to pilots performing better and gaining better results.
teaching units to fight isolated as also greats, as most of these units would be isolated. The Soviet way to incorporate air and ground in their combined arms was also spectacular. Their offensives would go even further, and with the added air support and the ability for the pilots to fight for air superiority, any challenger could be decimated. So let's get into a couple of cons. The one I think of most is defense in depth, which really hurts mobile warfare. Defense in depth is a way of fighting a battle. It's kind of more on the tactical than the operational, but it can be employed on both. It has a multi-layered defense and stresses the importance of holding a position at all costs. The Soviets may have had these tactics work well on the Germans, but the Americans in NATO were far different. American units in places like the Battle of the Bulge and the Chosen Reservoir were extremely tenacious in their defense when surrounded. While the Germans ran out of fuel in the Ardennes, one cannot deny that the Americans are constantly a thorn on their side, and units like the 101st Airborne were trained for situations that they'd be surrounded in. The Chinese also found out the hard way. American Marines who had learned from the masters of defense in depth, the Japanese, had employed some of these tactics on the Chinese, who failed to dislodge the Americans from ridges and hills, all while taking massive losses on their own. An entire Chinese army group, that being the 9th, was crippled by one Marine division, and the failure of the Chinese against experts in defense in depth, like the 1st Marine Division, could be compared to units who do not know how to fight in defense in depth, such as some of the American army units in Korea, who the Chinese rolled over. Defense in depth also puts more attention on the tactical level than the operational. One position can hold up an entire advance, like the Battle of Lazarus and the Battle of the Bulge, and one hill in Okinawa, that being Sugarloaf, hold up an entire marine division for 10 days. With the focus on defense and death being on the tactical level, the Soviet junior officers would have problems fighting this. It's a very hard thing to fight in the first place. This brings me to my next point. By making it so junior officers cannot be as aggressive as their superiors, this makes it harder for the tactical level. For example, the Mujahideen were shocked by the Soviets with Mujahideen leader Abdul Haq saying, quote, in Afghanistan, you need quick decisions, and still, Russian officers cannot decide for themselves without going back to their commanders. End quote. Basically, in these infantry skirmishes, the Soviets are trying to talk to their superiors on how to handle the situation, where Afghanistan is usually isolated infantry combat. The Soviets eventually figured this out and tried to decentralize their command structure a little. Another key weakness for the Soviets would have been the numbers game. Yes, the Soviets have a ton of numbers, but so does the West. You're not going to be outnumbering them at every turn like the Germans. The higher level of tactical professionalism in the West would lead to higher losses for the Soviets overall, where the Soviets are in trouble because the West can match them for losses as well as having as good if not better troops than them. Overall, the Soviet doctrine focuses on the offensive and winning at the operational level. Armored warfare and after World War II, paratroopers and helicopters would play a key role in attacking. The Soviet methods of attack, replacing units and cycling them out, as well as surprising the ability to trick the opposition would lead to more success, the success being in their offensives. The doctrine does have some error in it though. A very determined defense could halt the Soviets and delay an attack. The method of training Soviet junior officers also left room to be desired. Yes, they are aggressive in some circumstances, but nowhere near as their counterparts. Finally, to end with the pros and cons and the doctrine overall, I think what I'm about to say sums it up best. Most German commanders after World War II boasted that their troops, quote-unquote, won most engagements against their Soviet foes, yet the Soviets had the last laugh as they won the war. Now let's look at the doctrine in real-world situations. No, I'm not going to use World War II because I just listed a good amount above. Let's look at non-Soviet forces using the same doctrines to prove that it can be applied in other parts of the world. Let's start with the doctrine directly being applied to some American forces in Korea in 1950. The North Koreans wanted to take the South back. They saw it as their war and their civil war and didn't expect the Americans to get involved. The North Koreans were receiving more modern equipment from Russia than China did in their civil war, as well as Soviet advisors. The Soviet generals also looked at the North Korean plans for the invasion and completely rewrote them. The offensive would be more Soviet-like, with Soviet equipment and units fighting in the Soviet way. North Korean and eventually Cuban officers knew Soviet doctrine so well that the Russians, when they were short on officers, brought them in to train Russian officers. The North Koreans silently lined up and made ready to launch their attack. Then on June 25th, the North Koreans attacked in full force. Some South Korean units, or ROK troops, didn't even know what happened before they were surrounded and decimated. 
One Russian general gave the North Koreans the ultimate compliment. They had moved faster than the Russians did. The North Koreans, or DPK troops, focused on attacking all the way down towards the bottom of the peninsula. The Americans and South Koreans, or the United Nations forces, were denied the ability to counterattack as they were constantly pushed further and further south. The Americans tried to put more and more forces into Korea to try to stop the DBK troops, only for them to get encircled like at the Koom River in Taejeon. The North Korean troops attacked on the wings like the Soviets did, and they used combined arms along with fast-moving armor, which stunned UN forces. Every time the UN forces tried to regroup, they'd just be decimated again. The UN forces were eventually pushed down to the Pusan perimeter. The NK forces now had victory in sight. 70,000 DPK troops surrounded 92,000 United Nations troops, but the tables would turn. The North Korean forces were unable to dislodge this new determined defense. The North Korean forces still used combined arms and tried multiple times to punch through the United Nations lines, but just couldn't break in. Meanwhile, troops were flooding into the Pusan perimeter, and now the pocket had as many as 225,000 United Nations troops in it. The Americans too were bringing in newer tanks, in which they'd have 500 compared to the North Koreans' 50. The North Koreans also didn't count for the American air power, which were decimating the North Korean forces and supply lines. The United Nations would counterattack and land on Incheon, but North Koreans still tried to pull it back. Every time the UN attacked, the North Koreans counterattacked viciously. The Americans then pushed the North Koreans back further and further into Korea, but then the Chinese would enter the war, but that's a story for another day. The North Koreans had tried and failed, but it proved that the Soviet doctrine was very effective. The North Koreans used a good amount of deception as well as intelligence gathering, including tactical level patrols and almost always capitalized on mistakes on, from their enemy. The North Koreans also maneuvered so much that U.S. forces expected to be flanked, on the defense, the North Koreans were too formidable, using feints and counterattacks very often. The ability to keep attacking also made it so that the United Nations forces could never set up a new line and were constantly being pushed back. In the air, the North Koreans were decimated. The Americans had jet aircraft and had veteran pilots from World War II. The U.S. Air also decimated DPK armor and supplies that by the time Pusan came around, most North Korean tanks were out of fuel or running on fumes. Overall, this just proves that the Soviet doctrine was very effective against an opponent that wasn't Germany. And the doctrine did miss out in a couple of areas, such as the inability to dislodge a determined group of United Nations defenders, which would happen a couple more times in the war. Let's move on to our next example. A country one would not think would be good at warfare, but was, is Cuba. The Cuban military too employed Soviet doctrine and managed to get in combat with American forces on Granada, but I'm not going to talk about that fight. Instead, I'm going to look at Angola. In 1975, the Angolan Revolution under the MPLA was in trouble. They were fighting Portuguese special forces, Western mercenaries, and South Africa's defense force. Cuba sent 36,000 combat troops and 300 tanks. At first, it was a full-on Cuban effort, but the Soviets eventually came in and helped with the airlift. The Cubans basically took control over most of the affairs and started fighting. They surprised the opposition on November 10th. A thousand Cuban soldiers, along with MLRS rocket systems, managed to stop the FNLA from crossing the Bingo River, as well as luring them into killing fields where the rocket artillery devastated the FNLA forces. Other offensives were stopped cold in their tracks by Cuban forces. But the greatest challenge of all would come from the South African Defense Force. They had been trained by Israeli forces and adopted the Israeli maneuver way of war, and were very good at it. These forces would meet near the Cueve River. And I also apologize for my horrible pronunciation. The Cubans sent screening attacks as well as destroying bridges to stop the crossing. The Cubans then fortified the river, and the SADF decided to try to flank the Cubans by crossing the Niha River. On November 23rd, the Cubans managed to catch part of the SADF forces in Ebo and managed to destroy as many as 60% of their armored fighting vehicles. Later on, the SADF managed to get some revenge, as they beat a somewhat green Cuban and FAPLA force at the Battle of Bridge 14, but units were flooded in to stop the South African breakthrough, so the SADF were unable to really capitalize on this one. The war was somewhat in a stalemate, but now the Cuban and FAPLA forces felt confident enough to attack on their own. This joint offensive, planned and led by Cuban forces, focused on the Mudunda Hills south of Luanda,
The Cubans made good use of their rocket artillery yet again and were able to catch and push the SADF and UNITA forces out of the area. The defeat was so bad that the South Africans pulled out of the war. With the SADF out of the war, the Cubans then rushed to destroy the UNITA forces. They used armored columns to advance into enemy territory and smashed the UNITA forces around and crippled it so much that the military needed to revert to guerrilla warfare instead of conventional warfare. With this front secure, the Cubans and the FAPLA then focused their attention back towards the FNLA and the Zarian allies. An offensive was launched that overran several key airfields as well as Carmona. A pincer attack was too able to envelop FNLA forces at Sao Salvador. The victory was so great that the FNLA was never again able to pose a serious threat to the MPLA. Angola and the MPLA was now secured. Well, temporarily. Angola would soon revert back to civil war. But the Cubans had conventionally beaten a very powerful country, South Africa. The Cubans were able to show off the Soviet doctrine in a lot of areas. First off, their attacks and focusing on the attack allowed them to control where to fight the battle. They did not need to fight on two fronts. Instead, they just focused on one at a time. Attacking two allowed the Cubans to decisively use their rocket artillery and combined arms warfare against the opposition, using it in areas where they knew the enemy was weakened. Cuban use of combined arms warfare and maneuver warfare was nothing but impressive. The focus on operational warfare led the Cubans to controlling where to attack and defend, which too allowed them to win the campaigns they found themselves in. Overall, the Cubans made good use of Soviet warfare and the Soviet doctrine, and were able to beat the powerful South Africa. This proved that the Soviet doctrine could be applied to multiple wars that were just not World War II in Korea. So these are two examples of Soviet doctrine being applied in real-world situations. There are also a couple of quote-unquote pretenders when it comes to the Soviet doctrine. For example, many Middle Eastern armies rely on Soviet doctrine, yet implement it so incorrectly that it gives the Soviet advisors headaches, such as Egypt. But the doctrine is very powerful when used correctly. So this is a basic summary of Soviet doctrine and the Soviet way of warfare. I know there are exceptions, especially when it comes to other countries and how they implement it versus how the Russians implemented it. But overall, this is their way of warfare. If you guys like this, then I'll do the American one or German one. I really like to do cover these in all honesty. It's like, when you see these patterns, you don't stop seeing it. Anyway, let me know down in the comments, and thank you guys for watching.